Joining me now, Dr. Pete Martins from Georgia State University. You are a professor of astrophysics and an expert that a lot of folks have wanted to hear from over okay. the last week. So tell me about last Friday. Well, glad to be here. And um, the sun is a very active star. It doesn't seem like that if you look at it from the beach, or, but it actually um, has a lot of magnetic activity on the surface. And sometimes you get these huge explosions and masses expelled, high energy particles. Most of the time they go in a different direction, not straight at Earth, so you don't have to worry about it. But you can still look at it through a telescope. And then once in a while we get, bang, get a bang on the face, and that's when it can have a lot of uh, impact on Earth. Most of it is negative, but uh, the aurora borealis is something beautiful that people love. Yeah. And if you get a very strong punch on the nose, then the aurora borealis goes all the way to the south, and you can see it in Georgia even. Normally, you only see it in a narrow band up north, in just north of our border in Canada, and um, no uh, Iceland, uh, northern Scandinavia, et cetera. Yeah. Talk to me about the rarity, though. We talk about the oh. levels of the geomagnetic storm, right? People right. hear that in the news and like, oh, G4, G5. Like, <laughs> right. How rare was something like this that unfolded last weekend? This it goes all the way down to maybe once per solar cycle, mm -hmm. best two. And a solar cycle is 11 years. That's just going, sunspots going up and down, activity going up and down. So this is rare. Yeah, rare. N normal northern lights are not rare at all. I lived in Montana for many years, and we had dozens of them every, every winter, mostly in the winter. But the last time that we might have seen the northern lights this far south, would that have been, you think, the Halloween storms of 2003? Or? Oh, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely possible. But now we had a much different, unique experience on Friday because people had their cell phones that are capable right. of taking pictures. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> so everybody has pictures, and you can see gr find a lot of great pictures on the web, also from the south. You, also, people in, uh, in New Zealand have, have seen the sudden uh, aurora, uh, yeah. which happens at the same time. Uh. And let's talk a little bit more about these pictures. I mean, okay. it was easier to see the northern lights and the aurora on your phone versus your eye. But if we look at some of these pictures behind us, a lot of the colors people saw were kind of hues of red and green. What are the different colors when you're seeing the northern lights or southern lights? What is happening with the chemistry in the outer atmosphere oh, of the okay. Earth? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so this, you mentioned green and, oh no, you didn't mention Yeah, that. green oh. and red. A lot of people uh, saw red. green, red, a little purple, like this purple, one behind right. me. Right, there's also blue. Uh, so what happens is very high energy particles, electrons, fall, or they don't fall, they enter the Earth's atmosphere along the magnetic field lines near the poles, where they are open, where they can actually enter, the door is open there. Uh, and then they hit our atmosphere, which mostly consists of nitrogen and oxygen, and those high energy electrons will then ionize those molecules there, so uh, either the uh, oxygen or the nitrogen. And as they are ionized, and then they re recombine again, and they emit light, photons. Uh, and those photons come in specific wavelengths, specific colors. So that's why you see the blue, which I think is nitrogen, and, and uh, uh, green. Green is the most dominant one. That's oxygen. But there's also a little bit of red uh, from the oxygen. All the way below, you get the ultraviolet. Uh, which comes from nitrogen, <laughs> if yeah, I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like any of the photos that people took were used as, say, citizen science? Like, do you think there's any, are there any research projects that are constantly ongoing when the sun gets into these active right. periods of its solar cycle? Yes, the, the northern lights and sun lights are still uh, investigated a lot because we don't understand exactly how it works. We get, we have the big picture, it's these high energy particles and it's uh, caused by the sun, we all know that, but where the high energy particles come from, it's actually different regions. It can come straight from the sun, it can, uh, because of reconnection of magnetic field by the impact of ejection from the sun on the Earth's magnetic field, which is a magnetic field, you compress it, and that generates an electric field that generates high energy particles. Or it can be electrons that were already stored in the Earth's magnetosphere, what we call the Van Allen belt, and then they're 
released, as it were, near the poles, and same thing, high energy particles or are. Yeah. Or you can have a connection with a coronal hole, which is a, actually a dark spot on the sun uh, in X-rays. Uh, and high, uh, high energy wind comes from there, and that wind can also carry high energy particles. So, so what you're saying many is sources. astrophysics is complicated. Yeah, it always is. <laughs> <laughs> a lot more complicated than just forecasting the weather in the troposphere. <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually similar. We, we talk about space weather. And, yeah. um, we try to forecast it because it can have so many negative influences on there. Let's talk about those negative impacts. I mean, when okay. you have a storm of that magnitude, it's not just creating the pretty aurora it causes uh, <laughs> negative problems for, for power grids. What, what yes. kind of problems can we see from a storm of that magnitude? Okay, there are many. Let me start with um, astronauts who are outside of the Earth's magnetic field. On the, for example, we're going back to the moon. They can be impacted by these high energy radiation, which can cause cancer and in the, wor in the worst case, just kill you right away. Mm. So we want to protect those astronauts. You can't stop the radiation, but you can tell them to go inside the spacecraft, which gives a, lo a, a huge uh, protection by a factor of 10 above. They might even be able to uh, hide behind lead shields if they take them in the uh, spacecraft, just like you do at the dentist. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is important for going back to the moon and for going to Mars in the long term. And this is actually my research that I work on. I'm trying to predict those events. That's your research? Yeah trying to predict when the solar storms will happen? Yes, and when they will impact them. So. And how quickly after the sun releases one of those, we call them ah, CMEs, right. how, <laughs> how, how long does that take versus a solar flare to reach the Earth? What's the difference? Well, a, a solar flare is emission of light, energy, x-rays mostly, and those x-rays travel with the speed of light, so they're here in eight minutes. Um, uh, but they don't do much. They're not very negative, so we don't have to worry about it. But we can see them. The warning: the CME is coronal mass ejections, magnetic field, and plasma—not your blood plasma, but ionized uh, material. Uh, they take from one to four days, and the fastest ones are the most dangerous. They have the most energy, so one day. So you get a one-day warning if you just constantly look at the sun. That's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we know the sun is in this very active period. Do you right. think another solar storm that reaches G4 or G5, do you think it's possible? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's like, is a tornado possible? Yeah, but can you say when and where? No. <laughs> so possible another solar storm of that magnitude could impact the Earth, yes. but also possible that the trajectory might miss us altogether. Yes, or it may not happen, such a big event. So all. cross your fingers, <laughs> <laughs> or don't well, if you're talking about yeah. power grids. <laughs> this one was actually pretty benign. We had beautiful auroras, but there hasn't haven't been many negative impacts on Earth. Because, as you mentioned, um, it can, in the worst case, uh, power uh, a powerful solar storm can knock out the power grid. And there has been a study uh, that started under President Obama already and was continued uh, under. Uh, under um, uh, Bush, no, it started under Bush, it was continued under, under Obama. And so they wanted to know the worst case and how often could it happen, right? Um, and the worst case is that the U entire US electrical power grid gets knocked off. Now that would be a total disaster. They're talking about t $10 trillion dollars of damage um, monetarily, but that's not the big thing. It's what happens to humans. Imagine Atlanta sitting in the dark in the middle of summer. You have no air conditioning. You have no Marta. You have no light. <laughs> yeah. You have no elevators. You have no fridge. <laughs> so that's tr truly awful, And depending on how long it lasts. The only thing that works is your car. <laughs> Yeah. Let's get in your car and get out of here. But all the traffic lights would be yeah. out. <laughs> uh, all traffic lights would be out. <laughs> so that's why that's uh, so important that I know it makes pretty pictures in the sky, but it's important for your research to study right. the sun and solar storms and, and the solar wind and, and right. how things move. Because yeah. if we can make the right predictions, we can save a lot of money and even life. And Let me close with this. Let me ask you, what excites you about the number of people who got to experience science on Friday night? I think that's great. 
And that's exactly what I try to do in my class. I teach one undergraduate class in astronomy. And I just try to convey to my students how beautiful the universe is and all these great things you see. And I'm not asking them to memorize a lot of stuff. What does it matter if you know 12, 12 moons from Jupiter, <laughs> right? It's more important that you actually see pictures of those moons and realize how different they are. So this is a, a free demonstration <laughs> that I'd love to do in my class. I actually will in, in, the, in the fall. Um, and it interests people. Now, it may also be a warning that, hey, bad things could happen too. Now, the good thing with space weather is that it's a bipartisan issue. And there aren't many of those, <laughs> unfortunately. But here, both parties agree, so we really should get ready for that. Yeah. So something that your research is so important to keep studying. <laughs> I hope so. Dr. Pete Martins, thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. OK. You're welcome.